Hello all, I'm Kel Kidman, welcome to Breaking Out the Daily, and man, it's been a bit more than a half a week since Biden has been inaugurated president, asterisk president. And let's do a bit of a rundown on what's been going on over this past uh, half a week. So, starting with just what happened in the first day, Biden has killed up to 70,000 jobs on his first day in office. Now, this is in reference primarily to the cancellation of the Keystone Pipeline on top of the fracking ban that he said he wouldn't do, but to anyone with eyes, it was fairly obvious that he would do because outside of Pennsylvania and the presidential debates, he was saying it nonstop. <laughs> it's quite funny because a lot of people on, on the... Joe Bi voted for Joe Biden because they didn't like Trump's personality side of the political spectrum, are surprised about things like this, about Vi Biden's anti-job, uh, anti-energy uh, independence policies that he's been doing. You get what you deserve. And that's a sentiment which has been very common among much of the right because, well, we told you so. And uh, anyone who's not, you know, fessing up, saying, yeah, yeah, I was wrong about this. Get over yourself. Get over yourself, okay? I, this sort of thing, Biden canceling all these jobs, and yeah, there's the argument that, oh, it's only 11,000 jobs that he directly made, made uh, unavailable, but of course there is the 60,000 or so that were, uh, were done secondarily uh, to other industries that will be affected by this limiting, and of course, there's all the future jobs that could potentially happen because of the limit on federal land and the usage for that for fracking, which is going to affect a lot of states, particularly states like New Mexico, which, by the way, did vote for Biden. And now the New Mexico uh, state government is very, very mad about, uh, mad about this for Biden. And there is all those sorts of arguments. But this, uh, this sort of thing, it's not helpful. It's truly not helpful to... Uh, limit these sorts of things to uh, destroy the Keystone XL pi pipeline to limit fracking. I mean, a lot of the arguments against fracking from an environmental standpoint are simply insane or not evidenced in the slightest. A lot of it is very much filled with propaganda, and you'll see, as you'll see with a lot of sort of political sciences, uh, and I don't mean political science as in, you know, political science, the major, but rather political sciences as in sciences which have to do with the promulgation of public policy. And particularly in this case, you'll see a lot of times where you'll see my dreaded arch nemesis of the computer models show up in a lot of these cases of uh, anti-fracking uh, scientific study, pseudoscientific study, truly. You really see that a lot. And, and, and these sorts of, oh my gosh, he's gotten a lot of backlash for this. And it's not really all that's been a problem with Biden. Of course, you have the other stuff with, uh, with him upping our presence in Iraq and Syria and the introduction to more Middle Eastern wars, which of course is necessitated by the fact that he's not doing any sort of thing to keep us energy independent. You know, if we're going to have oil wars, then... It, it, it would only make sense to have those sorts of things if we aren't energy independent and making us energy energy dependent on foreign countries is exactly how we get those sorts of oil wars and that sort of thing. Though, of course, I am more skeptical of that sort of narrative as I am not anti-war entirely. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm not fully anti-war, I, I, I'll say, because there is legitimate usage for war. There, there, it, it must be a tool in the basket of foreign policy, at least in my view. That's sort of what we have to do. Otherwise, it's just going to lead to a lot of problems. Uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of cases where you're just removing a tool from your basket, and when you're removing that tool from your basket and you're saying, okay, we're never going to go to war with whatever country, then it will end up being that the country will end up walking all over you if they're not intimidated by any of the other detriment, uh, detrimental measures. Now, of course, that's not always the case because we do have economic sanctions, which can, which can be a huge problem for certain countries. But, it, it, okay, I think we're getting off in the weeds. Because there's another thing that we're getting back to doing, and that is uh, President Biden is, going, is pledging $4 billion to Central American countries 
Oh boy. Yeah, we're going back to just pledging money to other countries, uh, essentially willy-nilly with no uh, discernment at all. Uh, this seems... Man, and the press, uh, the explanation for this, the reason why he seems to be doing this and why he says he's doing this is because he, he wants to build up the Central American countries so that there isn't as much illegal immigration. Now that's the explanation. And towards the uh, towards the first viewing seems to be a somewhat reasonable way to look at things of course uh, when we're talking about uh, Ill Ill illegal immigration a lot of the reason that illegal immigrants come to the u.s is because it is a desirable place to be however the fault with this sort of thinking and the reason why this is going to end in catastrophic failure is because no matter how much money you pump into these Central American countries, especially a lot of them with very corrupt governments, which in which a lot of this money is not going to end up going towards improving anything at all. Uh, we, uh, you, you can end it up, uh, up there, and uh, the fact that it's so corrupt, uh, the fact that all uh, that these countries are so corrupt, is going to limit your ability to actually d uh, fix these sorts of things and uh, make a difference in this sort of way already. But on top of that, on top of all of that. You also have the fact that a lot of these countries and a lot of these sorts of things, it, no matter how much money you pump into it, even if it wasn't corrupt, it's not going to make it as good as America, especially when you're getting the money from America. It, it, it's quite impossible to do it in that way. Uh, the reason being is that you're relying upon a country to give you its excess wealth in order to improve yourself. You're not going to get up to that country's standard through that method, all right? The, the $4 billion, in terms of an uh, American economy, is almost it's almost pocket change. Uh, not quite, it's still a good chunk of change. But in terms of the sort of money that gets flowed, uh, that flows throughout our economy in every given year, it, it's, it's much less than it might seem. So uh, this sort of uh, thinking is simply wrong-headed, and it's, it's not going to supplant the idea that we need to have proper border security, which uh, I, I think that is the, quite the most insane thing uh, as an explanation for why this sort of policy is being pursued. Uh, because he is saying that he's pursuing this, in lieu of border controls, in lieu of actually having a border and preventing this, uh, these sort of uh, migrant caravans that are happening, in, in lieu of all that, we're just going to pump money into these countries, into these countries that generally, uh, by and large, have corrupt governments. It's just insane. I, I can't square it in my mind fully. But that's not all. You know, I talked about, on Friday, about how... Uh, Biden was already flagging, and, and about how he was already uh, being dejected about certain questions and uh, being, you know, generally like an old man. And we're having even more of that with the Biden team has disabled reporters' live chat on virtual press conferences because they were complaining about not getting questions. Now, Biden, the Biden team has been very preferential about who they give questions to, which essentially uh, runs down to them giving questions to uh, <laughs> a lot of more left-leaning outlets. You're going to see uh, a lot of the New York Times in there, and I think CNN, uh, New York Times, uh, for the full list, the New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, PBS, and Politico were given the most questions, and a lot of preferential treatment. Even, and even mainstream, uh, I would say, uh, sort of more left outlets, or at least monoparty outlets, like the Associated Press, are being locked out of Biden's uh, press communications. This has been one of the least transparent uh, administrations for press, probably ever. I, I, I mean, it, it's not particularly close. It, he has been... Uh, is consistently not answering questions, having very short press period times, not giving, uh, and as we know now, not giving questions to a lot of outlets that would actually give him hardballs and instead going for for pe places he's friendly with, uh, to the exclusion of places like the Associated Press and Fox News, uh, mainstream outlets, not even, we're not even talking about the exclusion of, of more uh, 
fringe, you might say, outlets, or uh, simply right-leaning outlets like Breitbart or Daily Caller or whoever. We're not even talking about those sorts of things. We're just talking about mainstream outlets, legacy media outlets, that are being shut out because they're not as friendly, friendly to Biden as something like a CNN is. It, this shows uh, it shows a precedent for what's in all likelihood going to continue to happen throughout all of the Biden presidency. Uh, because what is going to happen is you're going to see a lot of cases where any media coverage that is going to happen and any questions that Biden is going to be asked to answer are going to come from very... Uh, uh, from very friendly outlets. I won't say necessarily left-leaning because I don't imagine we're going to be seeing something like The Guardian show up or, you know, some sort of more left-leaning craptivist outlet. I don't imagine that we're going to see a whole lot of that. But what we are going to see is legacy media essentially uh, monopolize Biden's time. Uh, that's kind of what you need to expect. And if anything, uh, the, the sort of shutting down of their live chat and making them utterly unable to speak, unless specifically called on, is substantially worse, substantially worse, especially in the environment of a virtual press conference, than anything that the Trump administration had ever done to the press. The worst and the, mo and the most similar thing you could talk about with regard to Trump and uh, limiting sort of what the press could ask him is he revoked John, uh, uh, who was it? Jim Acosta's, yeah, he, he revoked Jim Acosta's press, uh, press pass for like a week. And, and that's, most, uh, that's mostly because Jim Acosta is a grandstanding, bloviating idiot. It, it had nothing to do with the fact that he was asking hard questions because CNN was still there. It was just Jim Acosta's press pass that was revoked. And people were complaining about that as though it was some great affront to the, uh, to the First Amendment. And, of course, the decision was reversed within within a week. But this, you're not going to see much out of it. You're not going to see much out of it outside of places like Newsbusters or places that were actually gypped by it. You know, I, I imagine you'll see some from the Associated Press, some from Fox News. I, I imagine you'll see a little bit talked about it. But you're not going to see this sort of stuff on CNN. You're not going to see this sort of stuff in the New York Times because, to be frank, it's helping them. Because they're the Biden-friendly outlets. Yeah. So, to move on to our last story, and this this moves on from sort of the flurry of Biden nonsense and uh, propaganda. And, well, kind of. Uh, because to give you some context and to give you something uh, that I think is sort of a red herring that a lot of people have latched onto over the past few days, Biden made the quote just recently about how he wouldn't be able to do much to uh, lessen the pandemic over the next few months and wouldn't be able to lessen the numbers by that much. But And a lot of people are taking that as, see, he couldn't do anything. But I think this is a red herring. I think the purpose of this is to limit expectations and to lower expectations so that when uh, anything does happen over the next few months, that, uh, that they'll be able to say, see, Biden was doing so well. Look at how well Biden did. But to be clear, that's all nonsense. That's all a bunch of nonsense mongering. All of this is predicated on something that they uh, that has nothing to do with how much coronavirus is actually affecting the public. Or, uh, of course, there will be some change. I, I, I don't know if it will naturally lessen. But some of that lessening that will happen over the next few months, at the very least, will be due to a change in procedure about how we actually test these sorts of things. Because the World Health Organization has revised their PCR test after the current method yielded too many false positives. Now, if I made the argument that the PCR tests were making too many false positives, as many people were for months and months, and as much as nine months, before this decision was made, I would be kicked off of YouTube for not following the WHO's uh, health standards. Or, or at least I would be heavily throttled by them. But now, now that Biden's president, and he, he's been president for a week, they have magically revised their standard. And this is why it is so important that we are clear about what statistics are and what the particular statistics we're talking about are. Because in this case, I have always made it a point to be clear 
that when I talk about the case numbers coming out of, uh, of the coronavirus numbers, that they are not case numbers, but positive tests. And the reason that I do that is because that's what they are. They are positive tests that have been taken and then have shown a positive test result for coronavirus. Now, I've used this in the past to say simply that the number is inaccurate, that it could be lower or higher than it actually is. I made the argument that it was lower because many of the people who are asymptomatic are simply not going to get tested, and thus that sort of thing will not be uh, uh, seen. But now it's going to be artificially lessened. By the, uh, well, it's going to be lessened perhaps back to its natural number, but it was artificially higher in the first place. Uh, just to make myself entirely clear, I was a bit unclear in my original statement there. Uh, because the World Health Organization has now lessened the number of cycles that they are doing to test for coronavirus. Because before, with such a high cycle rate that they had, it was causing a lot of false positive to show up. And so when you see in the future, just two weeks from now, I imagine, or, or, or going on into the future, be armed and ready to bring this up, all right? Because the lessening of, uh, of cases in a lot of countries, I, I don't imagine that sort of thing will happen in all countries because some countries were not using the World Health Organization's uh, testing standard. A uh, good example of this is China, actually. <laughs> Quite funny, actually. And, and so you'll see a lessening in a lot of places that are following the WHO's guidelines. And though the U.S. was not strictly following the WHO's guidelines, in our case, and weren't, uh, and uh, because we weren't a part of the health, uh, World Health Organization for a good year there, I don't know if we were actually officially out, but we weren't at least taking a lot of their advice, or at least ostensibly we weren't. Uh, our testing method looked very similar to how the WHO was recommending it, uh, but expect the testing method to change. And when you see that lessening, be clear, it's not because Joe Biden magically made the virus go away or made it affect people less. No, it has nothing to do with that. Rather, it's because the testing method changed. And that's why it's so important that we say that this is a measure of positive tests. Because once you're clear that it's a measure of positive tests, then it becomes quite easy to say, well, yeah, but we changed the testing method, so of course the positive tests are going to, you know, how many positive tests we have is going to change and even lessen because what we specifically did was to limit the number of false positives. Obviously. All right? So you need to be armed for them. And, and if anyone brings it up, and I'm sure it will in many online arguments coming, over the next few, uh, coming up the next few weeks, be ready for that. I, I truly do suggest it, and it, it'll be quite fun to see how these sorts of arguments go. It, it, you know, as someone who likes my occasional internet argument, it'll be quite fun to see that. And anyway, I think that's where I'm going to leave you guys today. I'll see you guys tomorrow, though I will probably still have the same shirt on because I'm going to be recording two videos today. <laughs> uh, but I'll see you guys tomorrow. This has been Breaking on the Daily. I'm Kel Kidman, and I'm out.